Good morning. We are in Perek Tetvav, chapter 15 of Sefer Yeshayahu. And today I want to handle the Perek a little bit differently than I have in the last several weeks, with a little bit more of an introduction. And the introduction I have goes to be his courtesy of Rav Schwab. Rav Schwab. No. Um, now, Rav Shimon Schwab was the leader of the community in um, in Washington Heights, the German Jewish community, the extra community. And in his role, he was not only their postsake, he was not only their rub, but he was also a great teacher of Tanakh. Over the course of his rabbanus, he taught almost all of the Sifrei Tanakh. There were only two or three Sfarim that he didn't teach. And several years back, um, they discovered his uh, audio tapes of his Sheirim on Sefer Yeshayahu. And they were shared with his son. And over several years, his son edited those audio tapes to produce a book that was um, that was published by Art Scroll called Rav Schwab on Yeshayahu. Uh, he taught Yeshayahu for about three years in the shul. Now, Rav Schwab's uh, style was not only to use also classic chazam, but also he obviously used Julius's Her Julius Hirsch's commentary on Sefer Yeshayahu. That was Rav Shamsha Rafal Hirsch's son's commentary, which was available on, until recently only in German. It has also been translated. Uh, but in addition to it, he also used uh, a lot of his experience and a lot of his vast knowledge. He always said that the only way you can learn Tanakh is if you first know Chazal. After you learn Chazal, then you can go back and under, really understand Tanakh. But he was also a historian of Schwab. And so in his introduction, which isn't on every chapter, he has a, a pretty extensive introduction to this parak, which I uh, reproduced for everyone. For those who are online, I sent it out last night. And he wants to put things in context. And putting it in context, this chapter, which is going to be the Masa Moav, it's going to be ultimately the destruction of Moab. It's the prophecy about Moab. Masah is one of the 10 languages. We've had it already a couple of times. The prophecy about the destruction of Moab, he wants to put it in context, a historical context. But first, before we even touch upon him, I also passed out copies of a map of Moab. Now, Moab, to recall, is located in Transjordan on the other side of the Dead Sea. It's south. Okay, so it's the southern half of the Dead Sea is where Moab is located primarily. It started all the way up where Ammon was, but Ammon actually had conquered part of Moab. And so from here down, you find Moab. It also had had these places originally. When, if you recall, we're reading about it, you know, in these last few weeks, when the Jews came and were going to enter into Eretz Yisrael, we were told that we can't go through, we can't conquer Moab because Moab is from one of the uh, sons of Lot. It's from our family, in essence. We can't conquer them. But we were able to conquer Ammon, even though the original lands of Ammon had belonged to Moab. Once Ammon had conquered them, we were able to take them from Ammon. We couldn't take from Moab. Moab refused, uh, refused to help us when we were going through. Moab had this attitude about them. And uh, this is something that will come through. Now, in Rav Schwab's piece, the highlighting uh, that I did on the on these pages are my own highlighting, not his. Okay, what we need to understand is Moab is going to be destroyed, not by the Jews, but Moab is going to be destroyed by the Assyrians. So even though this is a prophecy being given by Yeshayahu, the Jewish Navi, it's talking about something that's going to happen to them by someone else. Now, we know in terms of Moab, and just to jump through this very quickly, we know in the second paragraph I mentioned, I highlight that we weren't allowed to go through because it was given as an inheritance, HaKadosh Baruch who gave Moab's land to them. Originally, that Moab had even further up, okay, however, the Emori conquered even more. And when the Amori conquered even more, this is the higher part up here with the Amori, the Amori were able to go through, I'm sorry, Ammon was always Ammon. It was the Amori area, the northern part, which was conquered by them. And when it was conquered by them, we were allowed to take over the Amori portion. Sichon Melech Amori is the classic king who Moshe Rabbeinu had encountered. Now, over the course of the generations, by and large, Moab 
was subdued by most of the kings. David Amelech imposed great taxes upon them. They were subdued up until the time of Ahav, of the evil king Ahav. Ahav's wife was Izeva, was Jezebel. We remember his time after he passed away. Then they began to rebel against the Jewish people. They created an alliance with the Assyrians, actually. And with their alliance with the Assyrians was because they made a very simple calculation. We hate the Jews. Since we hate the Jews, and the Assyrians hate the Jews, they should be our friends. It really works out well. The, and in fact, when the Jews, the, the first areas to be exiled were from Transjordan, when the Jews were leaving, Moab gave them a very rough time on their way out. But the interesting thing is when the Assyrians rose to power, okay, and this should not come very be a very surprising piece, when the Assyrians came to power and they did, ultimately they went ahead and conquered Moab. Just think about for a moment World War II and the Russians together with the Nazis, Yimach Shemam. Originally they're allies, and then when the, the Nazis wanted to do what they wanted to do, then they break that alliance as well. Uh, uh, Syria was also an evil our history with them began going back to Bilam, if you remember. The story of Bilam, Moab was very, very concerned about the Jews. They tried to get rid of us. Um, we had an even further Ehud Ben Gera ultimately uh, stood up one of the great Shoftim and Sefer Shoftim stood up for the Jews as well. We have a number of pieces of where Moab has been very cruel to the Jewish people. This chapter, however, is about going to be the defeat of Moab. Now, one interesting thing, not actually from this time period, but one more interesting fact of all of this, just to be aware, there is a fascinating, um, not really a document, a steel that was discovered late 1800s called the Mesha steel. The reason why it's called the Mesha steel, and there's a picture of it, it's in the Louvre, is the original. Um, the Mesha steel is a history, really, that was written in the time of King Mesha. We know about King Mesha. King Mesha was at the same time as Ahav. Remember, after Ahav's death, then that's when the, Moab, the, Moab, the Moabites began to rise up against the Jews in a significant way. This document is significant, or the steel is significant, because it's the first time where, where we have a, a document from the non-Jewish world that refers to HaKadosh Baruch Hu as the Yud Kevavke, refers to the Jewish God with the name of the Jewish God. Okay, and it has it in here. And what's interesting is that in this document, we find a lot of names of cities of Moab. This is a document where Mesha is bragging about his power and his conquest of the Jews. Again, the highlighted portions there, it's a 34 line steel. And so these are the numbers are each line of the steel, even though as you notice from the very first line, Devon, one of the cities is broken between two lines is Mesha. OK, the he is um, a servant of the God who's known as Chemosh. And in this, he's going to talks about the Jews. Line five, Omri, king of Israel, the son of Ahab, oppressed Moab for a long time because Chemosh was angry with his country. His son succeeded, and he also planned to oppress Moab. Then all of a sudden, you have the situation where you see that Moab rises up and begins to conquer the Jews. And all of the lists of the lands that he conquered the Jews. You notice all the way down to line 18, that's where you have Shem Hashem, Yahweh. Okay, is the Shem Hashem? It's not a not really how we pronounce it, but uh, it's as, as official as you'd have Jehovah, which is also not a way we pronounce the Shem Hashem. And you have Diabon, and you look at all of the names, and you talk, you look at this king, and this is really typical Moab on how they were so impressed with themselves. They were braggarts. They wanted to talk about their power and their strength. Now, the reason I give all of this introduction, and this is a very long introduction to the chapter, which is a very short chapter, is because when you read the chapter about their defeat and their destruction, you begin to realize that their defeat and destruction attacks specifically those things that they were most proud about. They were a country that had a great export, that they were very wealthy. Their wealth is going to be attacked. They were a country that was very, very proud of their army. Their army is going to be attacked. Each of the pieces that they're proud about, that goes back even to Mesha, even though it's centuries before, each of these pieces are things that this parak is going to address. This parak, unlike this parak, unlike um some of the other prakim that we, we have, this parak is actually a, 
first part to what will be next week. Next week, we're still going to talk about Moab. There we're going to be talking, as opposed to the destruction of its cities, which is the focus of these, of chapter 15, it's going to be destructions of the Kramim, of their vineyards, and, and other pieces of the puzzle and their attempts to escape. But here we have right now the Masab Moab, and I'm going to get into it now. So the Pasuk begins, Masab Moab. This is the prophecy about Moab. Kivelel Shudar Ar Moab Nidma. At night, the city of Ar Moab is going to be attacked, Nidma. Now, Nidma, according to Rashi, means without being able to respond or without response, like Dumiya, like silence. The attack is going to be done at night. Simply at night, you know, it can be as simple as it's going to catch them off guard when they're sleeping. Ar Moav, and we'll see another name, Kir Moav, in just a moment, is two major cities. The Ar Moav um, most likely uh, was a little bit north of Kir Moav. Kir Moav is basically the capital city. If you look at the map that, that I gave you, Kir Moav is located right here. Okay. You'll see Kir Moab on the map right over here. And our Moab was probably just several kilometers north of it. Is that it's in Jordan. This is all in Jordan, right? Ki Belel Shudar Kir Moab Nidma. Because at night, this city of Kir Moab was also conquered. Poetic, at night it was conquered and it was quiet. At night it was conquered and it was quiet. Two major cities of, the Mo of Moab were conquered or will be conquered. Allah bait, at that point, the people went up to the bait. Now, what's the bait? Rashi says the bait is they went up to their, their temple, their, their pagan temple. The divon habamot, and the people of divon went up to, up to the bamot, the altars, the high-placed altars, levechi, to cry. Now, obviously, we're missing some words. It's a poetic structure. We're missing some words. If you notice, by the way, divon, when we talk about divon, back in the Mesha steel, by the way, that's the first city that's mentioned that belonged to Moab. They go up to the city. So how normally, if I was writing this in a normal uh, essay style, I would say, Allah habayit, I'd have to say, who is going up to the house? And Divon Abamot, I'd have to say, what is Divon doing? But because it's poetic, I'm able to share verbs and nouns. So the way you can understand it, the simplest explanation of it is that the people of Divon went up to the temple, went up to their high places. That's the easiest way of trying to understand it. And that's the way the Dat Mikra translates this opening puzzle. However, Rashi says, no, we're talking about two different groups. We're talking about a people who first went up to, to their temple and also the people of Devon who went up to their temple. They're trying to figure out how to do it. The only problem is the first half, Allah Bayit. They went up to the temple. Who's they? We still don't know. So the Ibn Ezra says that actually Allah Bayit Bayit is also the name of a place. So the people of Bayit went up and the people of Divon went to their Bamot. So in each case, I have the, lo the location of where they went, Levechi, to cry. Now, when you have a mighty nation and a mighty nation is being attacked by their enemy, the response of that mighty nation to the attack should be what? an army. They lost it. In other words, the, basically what happens here is they didn't have the ability or the strength to respond. They just gave up. So as soon as they were attacked, instead of going back to them and attacking them back, they went to pray to their gods. Uh, uh, definitely the, the exact opposite occurred. You know, this uh, Yom Kippur, we're coming up to the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War. And so there are a lot of stories about the Yom Kippur War. But for example, Yeshivat Haritzion, um, they were instructed, the guys were instructed on Yom Kippur when the war broke out, they were instructed, don't wait to be called up. Go straight to your army bases on Yom Kippur. 
Okay. Why? Because that's what we do. That's what a nation does. A nation, if they're attacked, they 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 fight back. Here, this mighty nation of Moab, only response was to cry. Al nevo ve'al medva Moab ye'ilil. When it over and about the destruction of Nevo, the destruction of Midva, what they were doing is they were sobbing. Yalil is one of those words for sobbing. We have that I mentioned last, yeah, I mentioned last week that this is the whole question of uh, Ashvari Mintrua. What's the what's the name? What what are we those two sounds? There's a sobbing and there's a sighing. The Shvarim is a sigh. Oi, oi, oi. And the true is like that. It's, it's a difference. So Yalil, Yalil is that they're crying over its destruction. And Sudot David throws in that extra word for ban. And all of their heads were bald. And all of their beards were missing hair. Well, what is this talking about? We know that ancient mourning practices involve tearing out hair, which is why we have a prohibition, okay? We have a prohibition in the Jewish people of mourning in the practices that the pagans were mourning. And so here it says, all they're doing is they're crying, they're sobbing, they're mourning the loss, no fighting back at all. Now, grua means garua is uh, something bad, right? It's it's something deficient and bad. The Radak says actually, it, it, grua in this case should be very similar to the word gidua, which means to be cut off. Okay, fine. The exact opposite. Remember, we're now in the three weeks, so we're in a period of mourning. So men don't shave and we don't get haircuts. That's the way we show our signs of mourning. In the pagan world, the way they show their sign of mourning is removing hair. That's part of the reasoning for what we do. Bechutzotav chagru sak. In their streets, they tied themselves with sackcloth. Al gagoteha on their the roofs, uvechovoteha, and in their public squares, kulo all of them, yeyelil yored bebechi. They're sobbing. And they're going down in tears. Now, there are three places we're talking about here, three locations of this morning. The first is Chutzot. The Chutzot, Yerushalayim, right? What are Chutzot? Chutzot are, are really their streets. It comes from the word Chutz, outside. It's outside the areas, outside the houses. Nice and simple. A God, we know, is a, a rooftop. Now, when you do something atop a rooftop, what are you trying to do? It's advertised. It's a public statement. And the rechovot, even though we say the word rechov nowadays means street, okay? If you think about it in modern Hebrew, rechavat kotel, It's the large courtyard open area, okay? So originally what we talk about, they're mourning in private, just in the streets, but around their houses, they're walking around in sackcloth. Fine. But now it's become something that has gotten so big that it was open and outside, and the Malbim points out that this is the whole idea, that you're doing this on the, on the rooftops, and you're doing it also in the courtyards, and then, yored bebechi. They're going, they're sobbing, yored bebechi. What is yored bebechi? Now, yored bebechi could be a couple of simple answers. Tears are streaming down. Okay? It's going down. Another one, yored your aid, according to the Daphne Mikra, could also be to go down, could be a sign of lamenting. How does Art Scroll translate this one, the last phrase in Posa Gimel? Lament. What? Laments with weeping. Laments with weeping. Okay, so he takes that approach of kina, that is one of the kinos, your aid, Bebechi. Julius Hirsch, in the name of you know, his commentary, was based on his father's commentaries. Um, he says that normally when a person cries, at some point, there's a comfort to the crying. You know, just let let it out. Just let it all out, we say, right? You let it all out, you cry, you get a good cry out, and then you're feeling a little bit better. Here, when they're crying, it just keeps on bringing them down. Their tears are not accomplishing what normally tears might accomplish. They're in a worse state after crying than even before crying. But tizak cheshbon, 
ve'el alem. And the cities of Cheshbon and El Alem begin to cry out. Now, Cheshbon and El Alev, I'm looking at the map again. Cheshbon and El Alev are up here in the northern section, right along the border. And the border here is Ammon and Gil'an. So all the way up here are these two cities that are crying out. Ad Soar, all the way to Tsoar are the tears happening. Now, Tsoar is interesting. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Ad Tsoar. Um, I'm sorry. Read, skip the word. But he's at Cheshbon ve'el alem ad Yahatz. All the way to the city of Yahatz, they're able to hear their those cries. Yahatz is suggested to be right around here. So I'm from here, and all the way over here, as the tears are the, the crying is so loud. This obviously is hyperbole that being presented. Yeah. What is the relationship between Moab and Ammon? Brothers, remember? Yeah. No, no, not uh, familiar. The strategic relationship. They, allies or... they, they didn't fight each other. The, Ammon was much smaller. Yes, Ammon. much smaller. Ammon. Moab is a much greater force in all of this, right? So we have you can hear their sound all the way to Yahatz. Al Kain, Chalutse Moab, Yariu, Nafsho Yaralo. And therefore, the Chalutse Moav. Now, Chalutse Moav are the people who are in the front, the Chalutzim. This is talking about the frontline soldiers. You can hear their voices. Yariu, they're crying out. Now, Yariu, like the word Trua, they're, they're crying out. Now, it could be Yariu is that they're crying out or they're blowing the horns for help. Nafsho Yaralo, they're over the evil, this is the way Hirsch translates it, caused by the evil that they brought upon themselves. It's a play on words, yariu, to cry out. Yara, according to Hirsch, comes from the word ra'a, the evil. So they're crying out over the evil that they brought about themselves, but we find two words that sound very similar within the Hebrew for the poetic style. Now, your al at Smo, the Radak says a simple thing that he will cause evil for them. So they're crying out for themselves that happened to themselves. Libilmo Aviza. Now a very strange happen, things happen. We see the conquest of their cities, we see the depths of their mourning, we understand that they can't get past it. And then the Navi says, Libi Limo Av Izak. According to Rashi, and he makes this fantastic statement, Rashi says, Nivie Yisrael, Enam Knivie Umot Olam. The prophets of the Jewish people are not like the prophets of the rest of the world. Bilamayamivakeshla Avor at Yisrael Alo Davar. Bilam wanted to go ahead. And he wanted to destroy the Jews over nothing. Where the Jewish prophet, Yeshayahu, they're mourning over what happens to the non-Jews. In other words, Rashi makes this magnificent statement that we care about all of humanity. And therefore, Yeshayahu is able to say, my heart, le Moav Yizak, cries out to Moav. Something that we wouldn't have expected from Moab to talk about the Jews. But that's what a Navi is. And that's Rashi's statement. The Dat Mikra goes even further. And the Dat Mikra says that if you think about it, Moab is our enemy. In order for Yeshayahu to be crying over what has happened or to, to feel the sadness over what's happening to Moab is another way of expressing how deep and terrible was the destruction. There's a certain point you can have an enemy, but a certain point, if something so horrific happens to the enemy, you feel hurt by what happens to that person. You know, it's, uh, and I'll recalling another, another moment, if you think about Lincoln at Gettysburg, when Lincoln came to Gettysburg, on the one hand, he's coming as the president of the Union, but on the other hand, when he sees the depth of the destruction and, and the deaths that occurred at, at Gettysburg, he cries over everyone that has died. So great people will not just say, 
they deserved it. Great people, first of all, it hurts, but it also expresses the depth of the destruction. The Radak has a different approach to it. The Radak says, Libi Moav Yizak, this isn't the Navi talking personally. This is the Navi projecting what the people of Moab would say to themselves. Now, the difficulty with the Radak is to throw in that he's putting words into the Moabites' mouths and talking in the first person on their behalf doesn't seem to flow with the rest of the text. Rashi's flow is much better, but it is an alternative approach because, again, it is complicated to say that Yeshayahu, who is prophesying about the destruction of Moab, after all that Moab has done to the Jews, they aligned with Assyria, that they would, they would be crying this way. Now, Berichea is a very strange word, and we're really not sure what it means. So according to the classic approach, Berichea most likely are Borichea, the people who are escaping, the people who are the refugees, are fleeing from them until Tzoar, all the way to Tzoar. Tzoar is in Chutzlar, Tzoar is a, a distant place, according to most, uh, most of the portion, but we will reject it in a minute, is that it is a place that is well-developed. Why do we say a three-year-old calf? A three-year-old calf is fully developed. This place called Soar is an Eglat Shalisha. Okay, they're running away at Soar Eglat Shalisha. However, first of all, Again, Julius Hirsch on this piece says, wait, brichim, a bricheha really means the bars. If you remember the building of the Mishkan, when they put together the amudim, the posts that created the wall, the walls, the three walls of the Mishkan, they had brichim, they had like this long pole that went through hooks and it attached all the bars. It, it, it fortified it. So Rashi says bricha, and bricha can also be, by the way, a latch to a gate. He says, Rashi says, this is talking about the strength of Moab. Bricha, the people who are the strength of Moab are, are all the way out in Soar, are no longer remaining in the land. That's Rashi's approach. Hirsch says, the way you understand bricha, is those who had held the nation together, in other words, the security forces, those people are all the way over to Tzohar. Now, Ad Tzohar, but Eglat Shalisheha, again, Eglat Shalisheha doesn't mean a three-year-old, um, a three-year-old calf, a fully developed place. Brichat Shalisheha, the Malbim talks about this, Hirsch quotes this, Eglam, Eglat can also be from the word Ma'agal, Igul. It is a like a semicircle, shalisheha of the elite forces, the chel hashalishim, the three person forces. Now, in the ancient times, uh, Rabbi Eisenberg taught us about this many, many years ago. Rabbi Eisenberg Zal, he talked about when you're when you have chariot riders. How many people ride a chariot? You have three people. You have the guy holding the horse, and you have the two um, marksmen or the two archers who are shooting on both sides. This is an elite force, and they were a three-person elite force. You also have a five-person, similar kind of concept, the Chamushim. But you have the three-person elite force. This is their elite security forces. We're talking about Berichaha Ad Tzora Eglat Shalisha Kima Alat Haluchit. They say that this and talk about them. They go all the way, climbing up Haluchit, Bebechi, are crying. Yalebo, that's how they go up. Kidera Chora Naim, and when those who are going to the to where Chora Naim is, Akat Shever, Yo Eru, and they're crying out with a broken voice, Yo Eru, come on, like they're raising up their voices. So, according to the Malbim, according to Hirsch, the way I understand this is the Navi is crying over the extreme loss of Moab. The Navi then says, they're 
their power, their forces, their forces have gone to Tzohar, the Eglat Shalisheha. These are the people who are the, the elite forces. Then they go, all those who go up are going up to Luchit. Luchit is another city. Luchit, when they go up to Luchit, they're, they're going there. We don't know exactly where it is, but they're going there. Ya'alebo, if you notice, it's in singular. They're all together. That, however, then the next group of people already aren't in any kind of formation. There are multitudes are just crying out for what's happening to them. The waters of Nimarim, Nimarim being one of the um, one of the rivers that was there. I'm just looking to see if I can find it real quickly. Uh, Nimarim, if you look down here, one theory is it's this region down here, all the way at the bottom of, uh, all the way at the bottom, the Nimarim. The waters of Nimarim, Mishamotyu, will be desolate or devastated. Ki chatsir, the harvest or the chatsir are, are the, the, um, the grasses have dried out. Kala desha, the vegetation is destroyed. Yerek lo haya. Mitsudat David says, as if there had never been any green at all in this area. All of this area is destroyed. Now, what is the May Nimarim? We're really not sure. Radak says it might be a river. It might be a region. The reality is it might be both. It might be a river that's within a region. We really don't know for sure. According to Rashi, What's happening here is that this area is become desolate because of all of the destruction. He said all of the death and destruction has destroyed all the waterways. They're filled with blood and everything is, is gone. According to Hirsch, what happened here was that the enemies had chosen to divert water, that strength of a people is the waterways. We know this even nowadays still. You know, one of the great issues in Israel today is whether or not Syria, for example, will divert water from the Kinneret. And what are the agreements for that that take place there? So you have all of these issues that take place and the waters have been diverted and therefore everything is, is dying. The Malbim has another explanation. And the Malbim's explanation works if you look at the location of where, where Nimarim is. The Malbim says that there was a river, Nimarim, and the river Nimarim was the way that they were able to export their, their crops and their produce. And that river allowed them to go from place to place. And so as a result, using Nimarim as a river, what happened here is that river has dried up, and as a result, everything is, is getting destroyed and their strength of commerce, which they also held themselves in high esteem, is being, is being wiped out. al Cain, therefore, Yitra Asa, therefore, the Yitra many times they did, okay? Now, what Rashi explains, what this is talking about, there were many times this is happening, Al Asher, he translates Al Cain because Yitrasa. There were many things they had done where they had never been, where they had never been um, uh, makir tov. They were always kafui tov. The, the people of Moab took the, everything for granted. This is coming to them because, as a punishment to that, Yitra Asa, according to Ibn Ezra, no, no, no. Al Kain Yitra Asa talks about. All of the Yitra, the Yitra on all of the possessions they had, all of the wealth they they had, all of that is going to be destroyed. According to the Dat Mikra, Al Kain, Yitra Asa, therefore the, it's appropriate to, to lament right now all that's happening to them. Ufkudatam, and also kudatam. Kudatam is like the word pikadon. The things that they that they normally carry with them are being taken over. Al nachal haaravim yisaum is going to be taken until the river of Aravim will be carried off. The river of Aravim. Where's the river of Aravim? We really don't know. But an interesting theory. Excuse me. An interesting theory comes from Rav Schwab. 
If you remember in Tehillim, in the parak of Al Naharot Bavel, okay, the Tetvav, okay, Al Aravim Bitocha Talinu Kinoroteha. On its willows, we um, tied up the harps. It's because we couldn't sing anymore. So we, we put away our musical instruments is the way it's, descri it's described. Where were these Aravim? It talks about the fact that these are the Arava. There were willow trees along Al Naharot Babel, along the rivers of Babylon. There were willow trees. And those willow trees was where they hung up their harps. Now, using that, what Rav Schwab says, where were all of these things carried off? Al Nachal Ha'aravim, he suggests everything was carried off by the Assyrians back to Babylon, back to Babel, back to the rivers of Babylon, which we find described elsewhere. Kihi Kifa Hazaka, because the cries have encircled at Gvuladom. All of the boundaries of I'm sorry, Gvul Moab, all of the boundaries of Moab, Ad Eglaim Yilata, all the way till Eglaim. Now, Eglaim, the simple explanation is Eglaim is one of those places on the boundaries of Moab, Uver Elim Yilalata, and also in Ber Elim, they're moaning and they're crying. Again, both of those seem to be outside. Now, according to the Malbim, the first place, Eglaim, was just beyond the boundaries of Moab. And the second place, Elim is, Be'er Elim is far out. That what's happening is they're continued to be pursued and they're crying as they're running away from their own lands. Kimei Dimon Maludam. Because the waters of Dimon were filled with blood. Now, if you're thinking as a poet for a moment, which Yeshayahu is, listen to the sounds. May Dimon milu dam. You see, hear the sound of dam coming back, the Dimon and the dam. Okay, it's in Lashon no fella Lashon in the Hebrew terminology. Ki ashit al Dimon no safot. Because I will put on Dimon even more, Lifletat Moav Aryeh, to those who escape from Moav will be lion, Ulesherit Adama, and those who remain will be the earth. What's the lion and what's the earth? So if you go to the Oriental Institute, and you see in the Oriental Institute, who's the lion? Nebuchadnezzar. That's the way he's always depicted. That after anyone who's going to survive Sancherev's assault against Moab will be killed by Nebuchadnezzar. That's the Aryeh. She'erit Adama, the remainder of the land, according to the Malbim, it means whoever remains after those who have been massacred by Sancherev, pursued by Sancherev, murdered by, by Nebuchadnezzar, the only thing that's going to be left for those people is they're going to be buried in the ground. Nothing will be left of them. That's the way we take it one way. But the Malbim disagrees with Rashi that Nebuchadnezzar is the lion. And the Malbim says, wait a second, why do we have to go to Nebuchadnezzar? If we remember our history, after Sanacherev exiled the 10 tribes, and he brought in other people to live in that area, the Kuthians, he brought in to live in that area, the Kutim. What happened to those people? They were attacked by lions in the north of Israel. And because of being attacked by lions, what those people ended up doing was they converted to Judaism. Why? Because that we refer to them as the Gerei Arayot, as the converts of the lions, because in the ancient minds, if you're being, if you're having troubles, you have to pray to the God of the place you're in. So where's the God of the place you're in? Well, it must be the God of the Jews because it's in the northern of Israel. And that's how they took on the, and they became Jews. They are a, this controversial group of people, the Gerei Arayot, that controversial pe group of people, even in the times of the Tanoim and Amoraim, we were debating, are they really considered Jews? Are they not considered Jews? Because did they convert 
but really never leave their pagan custom. They just took on, in their minds, another God who would be more helpful for them, or did they really convert? And to this very day, for instance, we have the Samaritans, okay? And they are the offspring, the Samaritans who live, you know, around uh, Nablus, the Samaritans who are up there on Harival, they are the descendants of the Gerei Arayot. And again, are they considered Jews? Are they not considered Jews? They, um, you know, and they rejected, if you remember the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, talk about Sambalat, where they re we rejected them. We didn't want their assistance in building the second Beit HaMikdash. They rejected us. They have, a, they have a Torah. Their Torah is the same Torah we have, except for the fact that references to Yerushalayim are now references to Har Eval and Har Grizim, to, this, to the mountain of Grizim and Eval, where they, they, they still have high priests. They still offer the Korban Pesach. They don't have Torah Shabal Peh because they rejected rabbinic leadership since they rejected Ezra and Nehemiah. They were rejected by Ezra and Nehemiah. They rejected Ezra and Nehemiah. Those are the Gerei Arayot. So it says the Malbim, when it says, Lufletat Moav Aryeh, it means literally lions. If there were lions that invaded and attacked northern Israel, why can't they attack on Transjordan? It's not that far away. And those people who got away from Sancheriv, they were devoured by lions. And so they have another fate, another fate of death. It doesn't mean necessarily Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babel. This is this chapter. If you notice, we're going to start not with another Masa, Moav, Pasuk Aleph of next week, but it just continues okay, to go ahead and we continue to talk about Shilchu Har Moshel Eretz Misel Midbara El Har Bat Tzion. And we're going to talk about what happens next in this place where the people who are escaping San Cherev are going to request first to have um, refuge among the Jewish people. That's the next chapter. That's next week. And until then, we now we finish this pairing. Same time, same place. Yes. So the message that uh, Yona is going to save non Jews, right? The message is. Okay, you have to do that because you have to show the Jews what you should do. What's our message here? Let's get it. Well, so first of all, I mentioned in a shir I gave this last week that the Rav Soloveitchik has a beautiful piece of Yona, the story of Yona. Why does it come at the end of, of Yom Kippur? We read Yona because after a whole day of looking at ourselves and our people, we have to punish Borch. The Chazal wanted to make sure that we turn and we remember the rest of the world as well. Okay, so that you're right. Yona's message is a universal message that we have responsibility for others. The message here is these are all of the nations. Huh? Okay. okay. The message of Yona to me is hey, get your act together because other people are getting your act together and they're going to make us look good. Well, it's interesting. So it's not so simple to take that. We, we'll argue on that at a different time. But what this message is, in other words, the message there is hey, it's not hey, Jews. You know, um, if if they can do it, if the people of Nineveh can do tshuva, then you should do tshuva. That's the simplest lesson. But the question is, why do we wait and why do we insert it on Yom Kippur, I'm saying? Okay, inserting on Yom Kippur is creating that universal message. Okay, but to go back to what the message here is, remember, this is talking about the fate of all of the nations who have been our enemies. And it's part of that broader piece of the Masa'ot of all of the nations. So what is happening here is we're drawing out what's going to be next steps with each of these nations. And ultimately, Sefer Yeshayahu is a book that's Kulo Nechama, we say, even though it doesn't all sound like Nechama, all comfort, it's saying that we are going to be the eternal people. All of the people who have oppressed us, they have an end to them, whether it's this way or that way. And this is the Moab who've been attacking you, who allied with Assyria. Yeah, it's not so much oh. that you feel sorry. We we do feel we do feel sorry for them. We feel sorry. The big picture is what is the fate of these people who have oppressed you? Okay, and look what your fate is. Your fate is Mashiach. Okay, that's the big picture. Within it is this powerful message that we we are part of humanity and we need to feel bad when something bad happens to other human beings. You know, this is there was a source of many. Uh, Many discussions. The world today is a is is not a good place, okay. And unfortunately, if the only people we worry about are the Jewish people, we're not fulfilling our mission fully. We have to take care of the mishpacha; they come first, but we have to look at the rest. 
So that's part of where that comes from. Leah, yeah. It's interesting irony that Yishmael himself is way back the Mitzvah of the Moab. Yeah. Like, all come from an example like there's hope, you know. Inter interesting point. Yeah, a very interesting point. We have we have all of these different messages that you can come out of this, out of this parak, which is the the bottom line is there's about 20 different locations that are mentioned. About half of them we know where they are. Many of them are mentioned in the Mesha steel. We see a lot of, of story, but the bottom line story is the utter destruction of this enemy. And that other destruction is not something we're going to do. It's something that's going to happen by the Assyrians, but orchestrated by God in the end, because otherwise it'll blow. And today it's in Louvre, in the Louvre, in Paris. Uh, uh, it was found in Jordan. It was found in Jordan. It's an, inter it's an interesting story uh, that actually was found intact. There was a, um, um, it's almost like paper mache impression that was made of it. And then there was a bit of a, a tiff with some of the Bedouins who were there and they broke it. So if you look at the picture, it's been put together, but they had the perfect impression of it before it was broken. So it survived for 2,500 years, just fine. And then because some guy got aggravated about something, he took a hammer to it and broke it. Wow. And we have it though, but it's in the Louvre. Yeah. And interestingly, if you go on the Louvre website, it has a, very, a whole bunch of pictures of it. It's a nice sized piece. It has a bunch of pictures out of it. What I found fascinating is that it mentions that it was purchased. So it shouldn't be that it was plundered. Yeah. Okay, which is nowadays something else. Uh, it's written in ancient Moabite. The script is very similar to Old Hebrew, and much of the language is similar to Old Hebrew. Again, you can go online and uh, you can see the script, and it's transcribed in the in the in the ancient Moabite, which is one of the Semitic languages. We'll stop right here. Thank you.